look good. So here, P- Pewter shows up wearing all this nice clothes, looking good. Here I am all frumpy. My, my new office isn't even unpacked. There's files on the floor. Nothing's on the wall yet. I've got almost Ham- Hambrick is in his nice clothes, his typical. He's in his Oklahoma finest. His, uh, my great book shirt and my bib overalls. Welcome to another Barbell Logic podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. We have Nat Reynolds and we have Diamond David Pewter, psychiatrist to the strong. And uh, he's got on a French blue shirt and his eyes are just <laughs> popping. If you go to his uh, YouTube channel, this uh, you'll be able to see that and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll say, you know what? Hambrick was right again. Uh, That's good. And I really appreciate your overalls. <laughs> Let me tell you about overalls. Bringing it back, dude. Bringing it back. Overalls are so good because they don't have a waist. So they don't, don't have anything restricting you there. You know, they just hang, they just hang from the shoulder and uh, it's just, it's a freeing experience. And when you get where you got to, you know, when you can do some chin ups and you get pretty decent deadlift, you got some, get some lats. You get some tightness out of the deal. No, it's just, no, it's just like, if you don't have a great big belly and you got some, Oh, I get it. Show up and overalls, people are like, uh Oh, he's got an ax. Right. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you're using it like a squat suit. Oh, no. you like squatting in it. Cause you get that tightness from the straps. So you go down, everything gets real tight. You're like, I get 40, 45 pounds out of these overalls. Uh, we call these galluses. And when you squat in these, they will self adjust. They slide too easily. Really? Hmm. That's unacceptable. Yeah. It's the closest thing to a pair of overalls I've ever worn is a squat suit. Is a canvas squat suit. <laughs> this is pretty close, actually. Uh, Diamond David Peter uh, texted me and he said, "Hey, you want to do a show about the science of connection?" And I thought, I don't know what that is, but I do. So uh, let's let's do that. Lead us, sir. Let's do it. Um, yeah. So it's it's kind of my research interest, specifically in medical education, how connection takes place, the value of connection. So I've been monitoring it in some different departments here in the medical center and uh, actually meet with uh, attendings like myself and talk about ways of improving connection and give them their scores back and how they did. Wait a minute. What's connection? Yeah, I was going to go there. So explain what connection is for everybody that's listening. Like what specifically you're talking about. So when, when I started out in this, I kind of had a framework of what I thought connection was, but let me tell you, what is connection, how I define it now. So connection is, it has four components. One is empathy, which is um, the ability to read someone else's internal world and tell them that you hear them accurately or that you hear them, that you understand them in part. Um, Number two would be psychological safety. So the ability for one party, and this is especially really important when there's hierarchy in connection. So if you're a boss, Um, does the person under you feel that they can tell you if they disagree with you or if they have concerns about something? So for example, in medical education, it's like if I'm in a surgery and I'm a medical student, can I tell the attending if I feel something is off, you know? And um, then the third component is um, called different things, but it's like alliance or therapeutic alliance or educational alliance. But it's, it's basically, do we have similar goals Um, Do we have a bond? Is there an aspect of gratitude in the relationship? Do you, would you judge someone or would you lose respect for them if they made a mistake or would you care for them if they made a mistake, like irrespective of the mistakes? So that's alliance. And then the fourth component is feedback. And feedback initially, I didn't think was going to be a part of connection. But what we found in the analysis of the data is that if you scored high in those three other things, it predicted how high you would score in feedback. So, you know, feedback is like the ability to give information back to someone about how they're doing, about mistakes that they're making, uh, about the particulars of what they're going through. And so what we did is we built questions based on what the top level, you know, sort of feedback practices are and what we found is that people who scored high in empathy and scored high would score high in psychological safety and likewise and they would also score high in their ability to give feedback so why do we care why do we care so what we found was that if you are the as you get more connected um you stress out a person less. So like the stress markers, like the different subjective experiences of the person you're 
you're, you're, you're with decrease as you're more connected. Further, um, we found that the supervisors who were the most connected, the, the people sought out them for supervision. So there was more hours spent together. And third, um, as you got more connected, like in a linear fashion, there was um, improved uh, personal accomplishment, which is one of the three domains of burnout. Um, so personal accomplishment relates to, you know, how much do you enjoy your work? How much do you enjoy the things that you're doing? So the supervisors that were the most connected um, led to, you know, the people working under them having an increased enjoyment in what they did, increased meaning in what they did. The further, what we found is that when connection got really bad, so when it, when the score went from, you know, somewhere in the middle to below somewhere in the middle of scores, there was all of a sudden um, bullying and harassment and prejudice and bias that sort of started popping up. And if you were really connected with someone, that wasn't there at all. So bullying doesn't really exist until there's really bad connection. And then the final thing that we found, which is why it's important, is because the other two domains of burnout, which are depersonalization and emotional exhaustion, which uh, emotional exhaustion correlates the strongest with depression and uh, suicidality, and uh, depersonalization is kind of a dissociative state. It's like, I feel numb at work, I feel disconnected. So those ones decreased significantly only when you went from like almost perfect to perfect. So if you're, if you're a person that's able to create very, very strong connections with someone, you actually can decrease their, um, their emotional exhaustion, their depersonalization. And it's, it's a significant amount um, to the point that, you know, it's like something we would want to improve, especially if we want to run a company well or interact with people or have relationships. So those are the specific results from the data and the research that I've been doing. And what I'm hoping to do is to be able to teach people how to connect better so that they can thrive more in their different aspects of their life. So if these people can connect, and it's defined by these four areas that you just described. Yeah, say those one more time for us. The four, so empathy was number one. Empathy, psychological safety, so the ability to receive feedback um, up the chain, right? So do you feel safe giving critical feedback to someone who's you're working with? And then number three is alliance. So do you have the similar goals, uh, similar, a uh, strong bond and is the same page. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and then four would be the feedback. Like, uh, and some of the feedback questions are like, this person gave me feedback about specifics, not with generalizations based on observations, not hearsay. You know, so it's like, do you give them specific feedback? Do you give them feedback that, or do you give them feedback like, oh, you just need to, uh, you need to study more, you know, like really generic. That's yeah. my favorite. Do better. You just need to not suck. So if we yeah. can improve connection and it's measured by these four, th these four criteria that you describe, uh, everybody around us uh, d does better, is more engaged, less suicidal, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I, in the in the context that you're studying, it's in the workplace, and yeah, I can certainly see I can certainly see how that would be, uh, but I'm kind of interested in this in just in terms of just the interpersonal outside of the workplace. Uh, you know, I don't have a workplace anymore. Yeah, how much changes do you think? I mean, when I start thinking about relationships in my own life, it actually feels really similar that those four are still kind of the main things. Are there are there differentiators that you would say, like when we're looking at it from a hierarchical sort of standpoint of a, somebody who works under somebody or maybe a student and a professor or, or whatnot, when I think about this and I think about my relationship with my wife or my relationship with my psychologist or my relationship with, with Scott or my relationship with Brett McKay, like I think those things are all there and that's the reason I feel a, a greater connection to those people, even in my own life, that's, I, you know, that's not really in a hierarchical, I mean, my wife is clearly my boss, but outside of that, uh, you know, we're sort of on a <laughs> level playing field. Oh my God. Way to go, Hamburg. Uh, every time. Okay. So, so here's what I would say about that. I would say, um, absolutely, it's going to apply to all relationships. Um, that's where I got the data from. So I got a lot of the data 
to lead to this survey and to lead to the research from John Gottman, who does marriage research. I got it from um, Beatrice Beebe, who does a lot of infant mother sort of attachment uh, research. I got it from, you know, Therapeutic Alliance uh, is, is one of the biggest predictors of success in psychotherapy. So I got it from that you know, research. So a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm pulling from all different facets and I'm just putting to like a new way of looking at medical education because that's the little domain of, of change that I would like to in particular see take place. Um, but I think this stuff applies like empathy is, is so important. Um, and I was just talking with a friend, how important empathy is, especially when someone does something well, you know, like if you think about like you're successful and you tell a friend and does the friend react with jealousy or um, competitiveness where like he's like concealing some micro expressions of anger towards you but then in reality you know he says like oh that's great yeah good job or he maybe he doesn't say anything maybe to you know compare that to someone who when you tell them about a success they get excited for you with you um and they really cheer you on you know that that's going to be a better relationship long term so sometimes when we think about empathy we only think about it in the sense of like negative emotions like sadness or or anger, uh, but we don't think about it in terms of like the positive emotions as well. So now I need, now I need tips and tricks, man. Uh, five things they don't want you to know about maintaining connection. <laughs> they don't want you to know. They don't know. They. So, so imagine you're like, like I, I've never understood emotions. I don't understand my wife's emotions. I don't understand other people's emotions. Like, where would you start, right? Um, so that's where I've, I've come up with this way of reading emotions and teaching the reading of emotions through microexpression. And um, on my Instagram and YouTube, I'm starting to release video clips of like fun movie scenes and then analyze them for the emotional content and how to give empathy. So I'm trying to figure out different ways of teaching this because just doing the app I found is actually pretty exhausting like so i made this app called emotion connection and you can learn how to read the micro expression but it takes quite a bit of discipline actually to do it for as long as you would need to do it to get good at it and then once you have that information like okay i can read emotion on other people's face i can read their body language then what do you do with that um, and so i made three episodes in my podcast on how to read micro expression or after you know how to read the micro expression what do you do with it because when i just learned how to read the micro expression all of a sudden i had all this information and i didn't know what to do with it how to empathize how to sort it's of like wearing x-ray glasses or something it's like i'm not sure i want to even know all that shit david yeah you do though you really do um it's like seeing in color no, when you've only been seeing black and white does, in fact <laughs> what's that what I, said, I don't think scott does in fact <laughs> I do. I want to learn. So, no, I empathy's yeah. One of the things I notice about this um, this idea of 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 empathy, I think we talked about this some um, on the last podcast. You and I even talking privately is that um, that I I feel a deep empathetic connection to a small group of people. Maybe, maybe even over empathetic. If that's maybe that's not Matt, I don't know. Maybe that it's not possible, and struggle sometimes with um, empathy for sort of the macro world. Like to hear about, like my my wife will hear a story or read a story on Facebook about somebody's dog dying. The puppies, and she'll cry. <laughs> and I'm like, but I don't I don't know the dog, and I don't know the people. So I have zero empathy there, right? And yet for my, for my family, for my close friends, for my staff, um, you know, their wins are my wins and their losses are my losses and I take them really pretty hard, um, maybe too much. Um, I mean, what, what, is that, what does a healthy empathetic relationship look like with someone else? So I think, I think what you're describing sounds pretty healthy. I mean, if you get sad about every dog that dies, you know, like it's just, you're just going to be emotionally exhausted. I mean, there's, so the fact that you care about the people who you're around makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I would say like, if you want to connect with new people, you know, you probably allow yourself to, to empathize to some degree um, with 
with them. I remember sitting across from one guy at the coffee shop one time and all I heard him mention was that someone wanted to use his photos and he, and I saw a very clear micro expression of anger. And so I said to the guy, Hey man, I just want to let you know, that would be incredibly frustrating for them to want to use your photos. And I had no context. I was just going to try, you know, I was just like, I'm just going to try this out. I'm just going to throw that out there. Like, the, guy tur- the guy turns to me. He like looks at me like really seriously. And he says, um, wait, and let me tell you one more thing. The, the barista had no mirroring, nothing. He just was going on his thing. The guy was talking to him, you know, nothing, right? And he, so he turns to me and he says, dude, thank you so much. What's your name? And like immediately he wants to get to know me, you know, hear about my story or whatnot. So it's like, I think those, the micro moments of like emotion, if you can read them, it's like you can immediately launch yourself into someone's world and gain that connection so quickly. And it's so much fun because like, you know, connection feels good. Like I think from a very young age, kids love being mirrored. Matt, that was the most Southern California story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> no. I was at the coffee <laughs> shop. And this guy didn't want to give this other guy permission to use his, his photographs. <laughs> and I was like, that must be weird. Well, I, I heard more. Yeah, pretty story I've ever heard in my life. Oh, man. I should tell more of the story. It's going to sound horrible. But but I'm, there's, I'm, more. I'm, there's more to this story? Oh, yeah. No, but the guy was a professional photographer. He took these amazing videos and pictures of this person. They l- gave them to the person. The person put them up. They did really, really well like because of his pictures. And now this TV company wanted to take his pictures without paying him right. and put them onto their reality TV show. Oh, and he was like, more, that's even more California. It actually did get more California. Oh, this, this was in Hollywood. TV show. This was in Hollywood. Um, right. but, but my point is that you can, you can put out a little bit of empathy without hearing the whole context or even understanding the whole context. Yeah. And I do this for people with schizophrenia. So they'll have a delusion, they'll have fear and just saying to them like, Hey man, it sounds like that would be really, really frightening. I might not even de- agree with the delusion, but now that person is like feeling more connection and now they're willing to potentially, you know, take medications to reduce their psychosis. So I think it's a skill. Like, I don't, I, I guess I'm trying to. Well, let me let, let me ask another leading question here. That that's because this is the some people have to be thinking this because I'm thinking this. You're really really good at coming across as empathetic, and my, and my psychologist is too. But are you are you really empathetic? Right? Like I I, I I really I need to ask this question. I think it's an important question because it sounds like a strategy right now in the way you're explaining it to me. And I, and, and I believe that you are, a, I certainly believe that you're a more empathetic human than I am in general. And, and we're both light years beyond Scott. Like he's not even close. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, but the, the question is, did you really empathize with this guy having his, photographer, his photography stolen or was it just a strategy for an end to make a connection with this? And at what point, you know, like where do you draw the line there? Okay, so let me just tell people who can't see Matt as he as he asks that question. As he says, now, is this just a strategy? There's a micro expression of anger that flashes on his face. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, Matt, do you are you concerned that I'm just using strategies when I connect with you? Or is this like a real, am I a real human being, you know? Sure. I, I believe you're a real human being. You and I have done, I, mean, I can say this, I, you probably can't say this officially on the air, but I can, you and I have done a session together, like an actual private session. And it was one of the most, it was one of the most wonderful sessions I've ever done. And I felt like because very quickly you were able to get to the point where you empathized with, with my feelings. You were able to, that, that created that psychological safety for me. It allowed me to feel, to be transparent without feeling, I don't know that, vulnerable is a word that I would consider sort of a negative word for me. Like if I feel like I'm vulnerable because I don't know if the feedback is going to be Let's empathetic, say what? Let's use safe. Yeah. I, 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 I felt, I felt safe being transparent very quickly with you. So I, I definitely think that you are genuine. I believe that you are genuine, but I'm thinking about the people who are listening to this 
who maybe struggle with this a little bit, do you sort of fake it till you make it? Do you fake empathy until you actually start feeling empathy? Okay. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about my own story. Okay. So I was more of a somatic person when I was in like high school. So I don't think I was in touch with my emotions at all. Like when I would get stressed, I would get migraines. Um, and when I, somatic. I was in, I was in a, body. a somatic, okay. somatic, somatic mean like stress would be represented not as like depression or anxiety, but like I would get migraines, I would get headaches. Um, you know, if I didn't like something, right. So it was like a lot of the stuff that was going on in me was like very unconscious and there was a big gap between the stress and the reality. So it comes out in a somatic way. Um, you know, I was, a, I was probably a fairly sensitive kid. Like I think I've always been, but I was in a very sort of masculine culture. Like I, you know, football, I was a tight end wrestling, you know, four years. Um, and then rowing for four years in college. Um, I did, I did, I did football and wrestling in high school in California. It was California. It, the, we did our team like did pretty good in wrestling. I did pretty good in wrestling. You know, I was, I was, I was pretty into it. The team wasn't very good at football. Um, but then I did rowing in high college. And once again, it's a very like, you know, competitive driven, you know, not a lot of place for emotional expression type of culture. Um, when I got in a medical school, once again, it's like very driven, you know, studying all day long, not a, not a lot of place for, sort of emotional expression. So a lot of this was completely foreign to me. And so much so that when I was in my third year of medical school, we have to take this test where we interview patients and they're fake patients and it's for this board. Um, and I actually failed it. And most people don't fail that. And I think it was because I was very, um, like I could not connect with these people because one, they were actors. Um, I thought it was kind of funny, you know, like when they were feigning illness, you know, and so I had to like learn some of this stuff and learn how to basically get back in touch with my emotional life because it was like kind of beat out of me throughout my early life. And then I found out that, you know, a lot of what I did growing up was peacemake for my family. So you kind of stuff your own emotions so that you can basically make other people happy. Um, and then, you know, so in, when I was in psychiatry residency, I had this huge growth emotionally because I had to get back in touch with my emotions. I had, I've had three different therapists and, you know, over the course of about seven years. And I think the micro expression was that first sort of inroad to me because I started to recognize one, when I would flash emotions on my own face and when other people would flash emotions on their face. And it was like, it, then it gave me that feedback like, oh, I just flashed anger and oh, I have a little bit of tightness in my chest and so what am I angry about? Why am I angry? Or I just flash sadness when I'm watching this movie, you know? So it's kind of like all of a sudden, like I knew I was experiencing the emotion, but usually it was very unconscious. And so I slowly had to come to a point where I could bring that into conscious awareness. And a lot of that is, was from feeling my body, what was going on in my chest, what was going on in my stomach, what was going on. They call uh, it feelings, you know? <laughs> So we really have experiences of them in different places. Uh, it's it's my experience, that, David, that particularly for dudes and, and you know and, and actually women more and more, uh, all the things that they've asked for have gotten them all the things that we've had for a long time, like uh, decreasing lifespans and more suicides. So good luck with that, ladies. But for but that they often take the first step is like recognizing that there is like a spectrum of emotions. Like most guys, they're like, okay, I'm angry or I've had enough to eat. And, that, 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 and that's what it is. And, and I, uh, I, uh, a lady, a counselor I had, gave me this thing called the feeling wheel. You've probably seen this thing. And it's got just like a, a few emotions in the middle. Anger, fear, happiness, contentedness. And then they, they branch out and they're into more and more resolution, more and more specificity in what these feelings could be. And for, for me, like make, you know, learning more about, about what they could possibly be has been her helpful. Not just like, oh, I'm feeling pretty good or I'm pissed off right now, but that there's a, that there are gradations of what's possible. And uh, that, that, that was a big, a big help to me. You know, you talked about when you were, uh, you know, when you were a kid, you know, you're maybe having to 
like help manage other people's emotions maybe or uh, what was it you said earlier? I was like, I was kind of Peacemaker. Yeah. I was a, I was, you know, I was the, ther- I was a therapist to some right. degree, you know, I, I, and I didn't realize that until years later. Sure. I worry about little boys now, you know, they're, they're in school and little boys are exuberant. Like when things are going well for them, they're exuberant. They're joyful. They're moving around. They're energetic. They talk too damn much. They talk too fast. That stuff gets stamped out of them. Like they can't be angry. Right, because that's threatening. Them full of drugs to anesthetize them. And so when they're, they're happy, they're exuberant. Over excited. Let's. That's right. And so they're just in this pressure cooker where they're just getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed yeah. every day. Uh, and the next thing you know, they're in Peter's office, uh, just on the brink. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I see more now, and I don't, I don't know what to think of it, but I see a lot of people who are just failure to launch. Yeah, you know. And, and they just haven't been able to take that natural energy that they have and move it into something productive, move it into something that's moving them towards their goals. And so they're, you know, sitting at home playing video games. Yeah, uh, there's a lot there. Uh, middle class wages are depressed. <laughs> you know, why bother? You know, if you can't, if you can't, if you bust your ass, you still can't launch because uh, middle class wages are down over the last 40 years. You know, screw it. And then, like I said, that exuberance, you know, when they are excited about dissecting the frog in biology class, they get, they're going to get in trouble. The, kid, the kid's going to get in trouble. And so the things yeah. that they're excited about often get them in trouble. And so they're taught for 13 years to not be excited about it. So it's hard for those people to find something they're passionate about. And it's hard for them to take a risk. And uh, it's, it, it ain't good. Yeah. Um, but connection, I, I was hoping that we could talk in, in some practical terms about how guys might, you know, be connected with each other. Uh, so we've described a lot about what it, what it is and what the benefits may be. Um, and, it, and it's clearly about recognizing emotional states and other people as they come and, and pass. Yeah, we, we talked on the last episode of the, the need, and Scott was kind of giving me a hard time about this need for, for actual, real, authentic friendships authentic relationships um but especially for men but certainly for for everybody um that that and and we got several emails back and scott especially from people that said i man i heard that episode and i was like i I realized i i don't i didn't have any i don't have any friends i don't have any real authentic relationship friends and um it made me think a lot uh over the last several weeks about my friendships and my relationships and the people who i hold dear to my heart. And as you go through this, you know, we, we didn't do any pre-show here walking through these four steps or not four steps, but these four, these four things that help represent connection. Oh, there we are. Uh, but I have that with those people, right? I have these, these things with this, this empathy and this, this safety and this alliance and this, this get good specific feedback with this group of people with, with six, seven people, in my life that are like, it's incredibly important. They're the most important people in my life that I have those things. And, and you, as you say, them, I, I also then start to think about the people that my relationship, we, we rub uh, against each other a little bit. And I recognize that those are the things that are, that are missing. Like those things are, and there might be, there might be some of those things. Like, for example, one of the interesting ones is the Alliance piece, right? Like the, the, this common, if I make sure I understand this right, it's this, this, commonality of something right is that correct am i reading that right that alliance it's it's agreed upon mutual goals okay and sometimes it's not like 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 you you haven't verbally agreed upon this but you kind of know what they are right sure so for example if you're at church it's like okay there's certain things that we believe and we have goals in our beliefs here you know and those things can be binding people together um i'm sure for your strength community it's like yeah we believe um in starting strength above you know stretching so you know true. we believe it's going to help um so yeah agreed upon goals and then also with alliance is there's like a bond the attachment and then um you know there's this kind of like how do you deal with if mistakes occur you know is there grace or is there sort of judgment and then disdain yeah yeah alliance feels like the thing that is almost of all of those all of them make sense, but Alliance sort of feels like the no brainer piece. Like, okay, like, have you ever met the person that, 
um, that you, you, you literally just don't see eye to eye on anything at all, nothing. And, and, even, and, and because of that, the ability to give empathy to them or to receive empathy from them, and therefore there, there is no safety and therefore there is no positive feedback loop at all. It all like, so a lot of times if there isn't this thing this, that we connect on, if it's not strength training or religion or politics or, or, or we're in quilting class together or whatever that thing is, and I, I remember the first time I met a person like that. Like I actually remember this identifying that I met this guy in college who literally liked all the things that I hated and hated all the things that I liked. We were at, we were at like a house party. It wasn't a crazy house party. We were just talking and like we would have a conversation like, oh, I like this music group. And you're like, what? Like that's the terrible. I like this. And I'm like, oh, you know, and like everything, like this TV show or this thing or this politics or this religion or whatever. And we, that we had zero, we could not find common ground. And I remember we actually, we actually were like, hey, man, we'll never be friends. We're like, shook hands, like, good, good luck to you. Pat him on the back. And like, we agreed on that. We agreed on the <laughs> fact that we would never be able to have a connection. And that was, it was okay. But like that alliance piece, is a, that's a big part of it, right? Like Scott and I talk about this all the time. It's like this common value system is so important to be able to have this connection with people. I, I have such a hard time being empathetic towards people or even accepting even if they give me empathy if we can't find common ground of any value system whatsoever like that alliance is a huge piece it's it's almost like the prequel like it has to be there you have to find that thing before you can get to anywhere else it, it, the way you said it was we could we can't understand each other right that's there's a lack of there's a lack of empathy there um you know, I have patients that have vastly different beliefs than I do. Um, and I think that just, you know, you kind of have to like understand people who think very differently than you in my profession. So I think I can connect with people who, who think very differently than me. Now, I think I probably won't be friends with that person, yeah. right? Like uh, if if the person is... I I can think of a number of things I won't say it, but you know, judgments that I have on them, you know, I may not feel judgment towards them and I can empathize with their distress and where they're at and realize they're in process, but you know, like it's just going to be harder to connect with that person on an interpersonal level in a friendship because there's just not a lot of commonalities. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you that, that those things are important. And when you're assessing, you know, is this person going to be a good friend? You know, there's certain things that you will, be looking for yeah yeah then what's weird is on the opposite end of the spectrum there are times when i meet people where i feel like the alliance is incredibly strong where we see eye to eye on all of these things but all of the other three things are completely missing like we see eye to eye about common at we have common goals common things like we have this maybe we see eye to eye on politics or and religion and the way we do family and all of these sort of things. And then for whatever reason, there is a brokenness there in the empathy and feedback loop. And so they're like, they're like on paper, it looks like it works, but it doesn't work in person. And it, and it makes you go like, this is weird. Like why, why can't I get along with this person if we agree about this, 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 and this, and yet I can't for whatever reason, there's this constant rub that won't, it, it just won't, it's not working. The connection's um, not there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's been, that, those times have been frustrating. There's not a lot of those. There's just a few of those in my life, but those, I can remember how frustrating they are. Like I wanted them to work, but it didn't work. And you know, uh, gosh, I was doing some, some prep work for this and there was one really interesting thing where they looked at friendship and they looked at commonalities in friendship, good friendship. You have, you know, pro-social behavior. So friends help and share with each other. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Is that, does it really say that? <laughs> it says that. That's the cheesiest bullshit <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me get to the part that you were just talking about, though. That was talking about, um, like, what are the commonalities of, of negative qualities of friendships? Conflicts dominance attempts and rivalry mm. so you know if you could be you could be in a, a rivalry with someone who believes very very similar to you yeah, that's right yeah 
because now we're competitors and you know like if if their only way of being happy is to be at the top of the dominance hierarchy um and you are right there with them you know then they may not have that sort of affiliative you know sure. you know like it, it could be like competitive and i feel that sometimes with people like i have this gosh i it's like i want to abstract myself from the so people don't know who i'm talking about <laughs> but but there are certain people that when i'm with i can feel palpably their competitiveness yes. with me you want to donkey kick them in the teeth and rather than be empathetic and because i feel that mirror neuron so much that like that like i feel so much of what's going on in someone's brain i start to feel some of that like competitiveness as well like where so sometimes when i'm with someone and it's like they're I'm feeling things or thinking things that are very, very different than I normally feel or think that I start to reflect on my own thoughts and think, you know, what is, is what's going on in my brain, my brain, or is it me feeling into their experience a little bit? Like what it feels like to be like them. Good. So Scott keeps trying to bring this back to practicality. So let's, 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 let's hone in for a second. So we've talked know. about the, we've talked about the, the, the need for connection and what true human connection looks like with these, these four primary criteria, what are the, where's the place to start for our listeners who are like, I just struggle with connecting with people. Like where do they start on a very practical level today when they hear this podcast, what can they do to start to connect with other people and make that first step? So give attention to people that you want to build friendships with. It's as simple as that. So for, let's, say, let's say you want to build connections with your kids, but your kids are like you know, post-college and they're, you feel disconnected from them. Um, giving them attention. Consistent attention over time that's not expecting anything in return is the best way to build friendships. So you know, going to a coffee shop with another dude or someone you want to be a friend with and, you know, finding out what they're into and listening to it attention you know if you are um if they're into weightlifting you know listen to their thoughts on weightlifting without um pushing down their throat you know the correct technique of squatting and deadlifting quite yet right listen to them first um yeah, we'll invite them over to squat yeah I, I think attention is one of the key aspects that we can actually control you know, you, your wife, are, I know my wife will get upset if I don't come home and give her attention for a good 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't take a lot of attention, but it takes like, okay, we're going to sit down. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to you, how your day went. I'm going to try to, you know, empathize with you, which is showing her that I'm listening and understand her to some degree, right? And you don't set her down and say, okay, it's a empathy with Diamond Dave time. No, not no. diamond. <laughs> but you don't also you also don't ask her about her day, and then you get on Facebook on your phone and start scrolling through Facebook, right? Yeah. Which is which is a re, the reality of what it, it it's what happens today. I, would, I, I think maybe we mentioned this on the last show. The idea that like you go to a I mean a nice restaurant, a nice restaurant where where the check is going to be relatively expensive, and just next time you walk into a nice restaurant, just scan the room. Seventy percent of the people will be on their phones. And all of them are sitting at tables with other humans. Like if you're sitting in a nice restaurant all alone by yourself, all right, you can be on your phone. Maybe there's another, maybe there's, you got some other issues there, but like I, it's, so that's the deal. I mean, for me, I know, I know attention for my wife, this quality of time for my wife and affection, like same thing with, without anything in return, right? Like, again, if we be honest, Guys are, are kind of constantly looking at like affection is often the means to an end. We're getting, we're getting to sex. We're getting to physicality. And I had to learn how to give affection without any expectation in return of, of sex or anything else, right? Like it was just affection because I love my wife and I give her that affection and that attention and she deserves that un, just um, distracted time that I'm able to give her. And by the way, that doesn't come, that doesn't come naturally to me the affection doesn't and it's tough it's been tough because my, my dad i've talked about my dad on the show a lot uh, lately but my dad was very naturally affectionate 
and the problem with that is it was great because he modeled it well, but he taught it terribly because he didn't teach it, teach it at all. It, affection actually came natural to him. And then I remember when I first started dating my wife and you know, I'm 17 years old and I, I, I don't know how to give affection at all as a 17 year old boy. And it took years to like really learn how to truly give affection and, and attention to my wife. And that's, that's all she needed. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, it sounds like that's been a, a learning process and something you've grown in. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised to have this conversation at all with you guys. Why is Why that? that? Uh, you know, like, I mean, there is like a stereotype for a uh, big, strong. Well, my first impression of starting strength was not this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I'll be damned. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you a few things that have worked for me. Um, you're right about the attention thing and um, the alliance thing. I mean, you're, you're right about all of it, but those, those things are pretty easy to generate really. If you're trying to grow your circle of friends, you know, if you say uh, every Saturday we're going to, we're going to squat or maybe once a month, we're going to come over, everybody's going to deadlift and then we're going to eat ribs and you invite four or five guys you do that six months and those are your guys, you know, um, the, my book group at my home is, is <laughs> book discussions, not, not Oprah's book club, but like real discussions about difficult things, um, really can, they can, they can drive wedges in between, between people. But if everybody comes together and they say, you know, our highest value here is understanding this book then they can c come together and say honest things about what they're thinking. Um, and then everybody holds that same value in their mind. And then we can disagree, but we all know we're trying to do the same thing. So I, and I've got, I got eight or 10 guys that come to my house on the third Thursday. Uh, most of those guys, I didn't know them. Uh, a, a friend said, Hey, maybe he would like it. And I invited him. And we've been doing this for about two and a half, three years, four years now, four years. Hmm. And we've talked about difficult stuff in an authentic way. Nobody's gotten angry, not once in all those years. And I don't agree with those guys about anything. And those guys are my tribe now. You know, we, uh, we went a couple of weeks ago to a cabin in rural Oklahoma and played cards and ate and, uh, and just visited for two or three days. And uh, um, that group of people couldn't possibly be more different. Uh, but we've been able to give each other feedback, uh, demonstrate this alliance that we, you know, that we, that, and Aristotle says that, uh, that friendship is, uh, it can, it's only possible between good people, similar in virtue, he says. I might argue with that, but it seems true. And, and that it's when you hold the other person's uh, good in high regard and you wish good things for them. And that makes sense. That's true. Well, it's true for because, all those guys. Because you have, there has to be a certain amount of character to be able to give attention. You know, there's some people who are so focused on themselves uh, that when they go meet up with someone, they're only talking about themselves. Yeah. You know, um, there are people who, whenever they hear anything good about anything in your life, they'll get competitive or jealous. You know, a lot of the sort of the ne negative sort of virtues. So I think it does take a certain amount of um, virtue to be able to be a friend. Yeah. You know, and, all, all of these things that you named, I mean, it, it's a two-way street, right? Like it has to be, which is really what you're getting at. There's a, there's a cycle that occurs here, right? Empathy can't just come from one person and never from the other person. And the, the alliance is there. Say what, Scott? Well, I don't know that that's true. Like we've, we're, talking, we're really talking about two things. One is friendship. Right. And the friendship, I think there has to be reciprocity there. It's got to be yes. a street. But you can, you can encounter someone that you find distasteful for whatever reason and have empathy for their, for their being. Right. To deeply. Sure. But can you make a long term connection, connection with that person? Well, I don't know about a I mean, connection. Peter might be able to, but that's Peter's job. But for the average person, can we make, I, I guess what I'm saying is that my, my experience has been, and I'll, I'll say it that way, is that, is that when they're, obviously, when you start connecting with people, you'll, you'll find these commonalities that create that alliance. There is co-empathy there. There's empathy for each other. And that opens up the safety to give 
this sort of feedback loop to each other. Like I share with you the things that are, that are struggles in my life. It's, it's safe for me to share that with you. You give me valuable, wise feedback, but then you also share the things with me that you struggle with in, in your life or that you're, and, and it's safe to do so. And I can, I can give positive and wise feedback back to you. And so that's at least the way it's worked in my life is that most of my relationships work that way. Now there are, there are some mentors I've had <laughs> that I'm just like, pour into me, man. I, I don't have anything to tell you. I don't have, I don't know anything that you don't know. Like I feel that way, right? I've had some older, like older generation mentors where I just want to absorb everything they say like a sponge. Now I, I empathize with them and certainly I would create a safe environment for them to share things with me. And they often will share stories that they can relate about when I was your age and when I was building a business or I was building a family or I was doing this and they can do the thing. But I, at the same time, like giving feedback, I often feel so unqualified well, well, to give I'll, feedback to some sometimes those people. But Puderian style feedback isn't about like a okay, here's your report card. Sure. Yes. It's like, are you being heard? Did that person understand the thing that you're saying? Are they able to let you know? Do they have the the skills to let you know that they heard you and that uh, so, they understood you? I mean, it's not just really about like a report card or more kind right. of stuff, right? Sure. So I would I would and, say. I would say, um, Matt, you, uh, you're talking about friendship and it, friendship is bi-directional. And if it's only unidirectional, I knew you were it, bi. It's going to be, um, it's, it's going to, you're going to come into some issues eventually because you're the one that's only giving, you know, and, um, you know, at some point you're going to be like, wait, I, I need to feel heard. I need, you know, something, something I'm going through that's hard. Do I feel like this is a person that I would actually tell this to because of how they're going to respond? So, so I agree. The connection that I give to patients is it's, it's a different, it's, it's weird. You know, I mean, it probably didn't exist a couple hundred years ago. Maybe it did uh, in like the spiritual leaders, the witch doctors, you know, kind of like how they used to interact with society. Um, but it's very unilateral. And I'm there for their emotional needs and I'm subjugating my own needs for their needs mm. and I'm, I'm getting paid for it. Um, so it's kind of like what I did as a child, but now I'm getting paid for it. So it feels better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let's go back to the, go back to the work. So talk about how that, how that plays out in a workplace because in that's where workplace. I started. Okay. How much of it is unilateral versus bilateral? So what I found in the workplace is that although there's hierarchies, people feel more connected when the hierarchies are not as, they're not experienced as there. They're there, but they're not experienced as there. Meaning like the person on the top of the hierarchy values the people like he values himself. Like it's, it's like he doesn't see the person as less than human just because they're below him in the hierarchy. Now there are some people who literally like ignore the people under them and experience them as less than human and degrade them. Like, and those are really bad connections. Right. Um, but in general, there's this sort of, um, there's a, there is a hierarchy and there's respect for the hierarchy, but there's not an experience of, of separateness from each other. Okay. The, the mentor gives more, but occasion, occasionally there is this value in a, sh a reciprocity of, of experiences, you know? And so there can be like, like a sharing from the personal life and there, there can be a bi-directional thing. In therapy, I think it's different than when you're in like a, a business leader, like, like yourself, you're leading a group of people. Um, I think you can uh, have it be more bi-directional. But you're, as, as a leader, you're leading towards a goal. And so that goal is, is, is probably going to stay fairly consistent, you know? So my goal for my residents and medical students I work with is that they would become exceptional physicians and be able to heal people um, more efficiently and with more wisdom. You know, that goal is not going to change. And so when they stray from that goal, that's where I may give them that feedback and I'm going to try to make that feedback as specific as possible, but the feedback itself doesn't change how I feel towards them. Like I still value them as an individual. I still believe in them. And that's, 
that allows for the connection to take place within the feedback. In a, in a small business environment that showing that the goals are in alignment is very, is very difficult. You know, I, I owned a small business. That business was created and designed for my benefit, my financial benefit. That's, that's why we do it. I mean, um, and I had employees that worked there and I was always very, very careful and very, I was always very careful to, to show them how the benefit of the business was closely aligned with their own personal benefit, both in, you know, the pay, although I find that people aren't as motivated by money as we would think they, that the economists would like for us to believe they are, um, but just also in their well-being, how they would find more and more satisfaction with the job and there would be more opportunities for them and all of the, you know, all the attendant stuff if the business was successful. And, and when I was able to do that better, we all did better. And when I wasn't able to do that as well, we didn't do as well um, because it's, it's very difficult to, in a business environment to say, Hey, you know, when the third quarter earnings report comes in, then, you know, that's, that's, that's awesome for you. <laughs> you know, to show that the interests are aligned is, can be difficult. Uh, although I think they are, I don't think I was lying to those people. I think I actually did design that business to benefit me and at the same time uh, benefit them as well. But I, that was a part of my job as a leader is to show how that was. And uh, sometimes, sometimes people don't want to see that. Uh, but man, I, I have learned so much. I do, I do calls with my staff every month. I, we, I take about 10 staff members and we do one-on-one -on -one zoom calls and there's no agenda on the zoom call. We just do a call. And, and, and if there's, there's certainly not a, not a step-by-step -step list of things we're trying to follow, but I, I'm just trying to see, I'm just asking them about their life and how much value they get from working um, with us, working for us. And um, I, hope they, I hope they get a lot of value out of that, those calls. I get a tremendous amount of value out of those. I learn so much from my staff and to see the value that they get because, because Scott and I have talked about this a lot, understanding who your client is in a business is, is one of the most important, if not the most important questions you can answer and understand correctly. And, and I believe for me that, that um, I was talking about this with Scott earlier today. Like I, I don't know any of Scott's online coaching clients. I don't know them personally. I don't know exactly how they're programmed. Um, my, my client, I don't like that term, but the person that I'm trying to bring value to is actually my staff. And so to understand and to be able to empathize with my staff, man, it, it, it means more to me than almost anything else on earth when a staff member can communicate the value that this, this, this job has, in quotation marks, air quotes, um, has, br has, has brought to them. Uh, and, and then also to receive, um, to, 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 to give a safe environment for them to give feedback for the places that it's not, that it's robbing them of value so that we can start to look at, well, how can we change that and give you more value? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I see things as a very, and, and listen, we don't run everything perfect at all. We are a very imperfect business as all businesses are. Um, but I, I believe it's very bilateral there. I, I feel as though I learn a tremendous amount from my staff. Now I also will say I respect my, the people who work for me, I respected them as humans more than just about any other humans on the planet, even before they worked for me. That's why they work for me, right? And so the amount of respect that um, I have for a guy like Jonathan Sullivan, I just had a phone call with Sully uh, right before this call, is like it, it boggles my mind that the guy works at our, at our company and there's so much to learn there. And so that, that understanding that value, and so, so I hope we're providing a tremendous amount of value, not just to our actual paying clients, uh, but to our staff members as well. And so hopefully we create a, a, a positive work environment there and, and it really helps with staff morale and, and that's my goal. I want, I want my staff to constantly get value there. Yeah. How can you have a relationship with anybody if you're not leaving them taller than you found them? You know, can't do it very long. Yeah. Can't do it very long. I got, I got a, yeah. I got a story, Matt. Uh, one of the guys that works with me at online yep. books, like one of the first seminar hosts, maybe the first, I can't remember Tim or Carl. So, Matt, Carl's the first, Jim is the second. Yeah. I know Jim because yeah, he's Jim. in your book group and yep. right. So I know him. Yeah. He's a, uh, 
a highly sought after electrical engineer. He's traveled all over the world and made money and been in huge demand. He's 65 and yesterday was his last day of work as an engineer. Mm. And he came by the house today and he's like, he said, I couldn't have retired because I wouldn't have known what to do with myself. And this has given me purpose. So I, I, mm. I quit engineering and he's, he's writing a book for us. He's yeah. writing an introduction to logic that can be used in discussion, like in seminar format. And he's like, I'm going to finish it by October 31st. I start tomorrow. And he's like, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have retired from engineering without something like this to give me purpose, but I needed to for my health, you know, yeah. just wrecked me. Yeah. We, we've had maybe, maybe 18 or so 16 to 18 of our coaches quit their jobs that they hated in corporate America to, to do this full time. And every time they do, like, I just lose it and cry like a little girl. Like, I mean, I just like, like audibly make noise. I cry right. happy tears, not sad tears because uh, you've been able to figure out a way that brings people value, not just for the client and not just um, to the owner's bank account, but, but to the people that are actually in the trenches doing the work every day. It's really, really powerful. Yeah. It's an objective good that comes. Yeah. Out this. When, when we think about, I have to tell more stories. It's, it's hold it's on. Hold on. Peter got in here. Wait, Peter's going to break that down. When we think about value, we think about financial value. That's the thing that most people have come to their mind. Um, and then we think about like emotional value. Like how is their emotional life going to be different working for you versus working in nine to five? Huge difference, right? And then we talk about, you know, physical value, okay? Like physical health, you know, and I think often we don't really think about like how you know, if we're in a chronic stressful environment with a horrible boss that we don't enjoy, um, that's a chronic stress and that's going to wear on us physically long-term. And then you think about like spiritual as well. Like how does their spiritual life change? So I think of value in those four categories and often we only think financially, mm -hmm. right? But we need to think about all the different ways of, that we provide value through service that we give, you yeah, know? Absolutely. I, I think I could say this and I'll ask to make sure it's okay before I won't give lots of details, but a Andrew Jackson is one of my, one of my VPs and um, he, he's a guy that's the liaison. He's an incredible coach, lives in Seattle, incredible coach himself and a super empathetic, great Scott. You had a phone call with him this week, I think, right? Scott takes me. He's like, man, what a great guy. Um, he left his job in corporate America and took about a 70% pay cut to come and work for me. Um, and, and and that, sorry. So it's more it's more than it's more than pocket. What's in your pocketbook? It's more than what's in your bank account. And um, and and I got lots of stories like that. And um, but but that one really struck a big deal because nobody else told me. I knew what a big deal it was. And he didn't tell me to make me feel bad. I asked. As a matter of fact, he didn't tell me. I asked him. I said, I want to know what you were making at your other company. He had already committed to leave and he told me and I was like, holy shit, holy shit. And um, the guy takes us, you know, a 65, 70% pay cut to come work for us because he got so much more value out of what it was. I mean, it was, man, that's a, that's a tremendous loss in financial value. Uh, but the life, the quality of life increase um, improvement was dramatically different. And so uh, it, it, it really, it, it affects me tremendously. So. The meaning, meaning, you know, the meaning of what it means to be doing it. Yeah. And it's incredibly, it's incredibly meaningful to you, I think, because it shows you that you're doing something that's creating um, impact, you know, and I think we want, we want to help people. We want to create impact that creates value for us, you know, sure. and him and him quitting his, his uh, day job to come sort of join in that. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I learned a long time ago that three generations from now, no one's going to know who I was or what I did. Three generations from now, nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care. You, do you know what your great grandpa did? Do you know what your great, great grandpa did? I mean, four generations, you have no clue what your great, great grandpa did. Right. And so if I can make an impact, a positive, I, I don't have this legacy thing that I need to leave a 200 year old legacy, but if I can affect as many people positively bring them value, not just our paying clients, but our staff and the people I come in contact with. I want to, I want to affect as many people as I can in a positive. And, and the crazy thing is what a, 
how much how much of a reciprocal feeling that is for like I get so much value out of doing that and so it's, it just creates a cycle for us um, it's been really incredible I, I I don't doubt that even if we change if our business 10 x's um, I still don't think anybody's gonna know who I am four generations from now I just don't um, it's very very few people are Aristotle and Thomas Jefferson and well Thomas Jefferson's probably not even four he's he's about four generations I'm like you know, it's not that far but it, like I don't know what my great grandpa did for a living. Well, I'm going to guess farm. <laughs> I'm going to guess Viking. <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, so that's a big deal. So that 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 value, bringing that value is huge. Peter, so what do you sure. want our people to do here in the next 24 hours? They've heard this. They've heard us get all choked up. They've looked into your eyes on YouTube. Okay. What do you want them to do? Make a list of five people that are good potential for friends. And maybe you haven't connected with them or you want to connect with them more or you want to build that friendship long-term. Make a list of five and then give them a call and meet up. Uh, either whether it's lifting or, you know, going out to eat, going to coffee, whatever it is for you. I mean, maybe if they live out of state, maybe it's just getting on a, a video call, you know, but make, make that... Um, Make that a priority in the next week to connect with these five people that you make a list. I agree. And then you're going to have to, you're going to have to uh, make note of which one of those went well and then commit to returning to that over and over and over again so that it can yep. pay dividends for both of you. So. Yeah. And then, you know, you won't end up like the, uh, the isolated male. And there are a lot of those. Um, we, we didn't really go into that, but there's, you know, there's lots of isolated males out there that have no friends. So the masturbating yeah. hermit, I call them the masturbating hermit. That's <laughs> oh, not God. who you want to be. Oh, I don't think they're that lucky. That's this. That's a visceral description. Well, I mean, it's true, and I don't mean it to be crass, but it's like that's what it is, right? Let, let's it's, go into this a little bit, David. I mean, yeah, we, we know they're out there. Uh, we know that suicide rates are going up. We know that. Well. We know that these guys are suffering. What did you want to say about that today? Um, what I would say about that is do at least do this uh, exercise. If you're, if you're a dude and you're listening to this and you're like, you know, I don't know who I could say is my like best friend at this stage in my life. Make that list and start pursuing those people. And if, if there are no people on that list, then put yourself in environments of, with good people. You know, whether that's a, a, a gym or a book club or a church or a religious organization, you know, put yourself in an environment where there will be the, that type of person that has the capacity for friendship. God damn, they might have to go to a CrossFit class. If that's, if that's the only thing in their town, do it. Yeah. So good at community. They really are. <laughs> so I that's, think there are a lot of people that may have just heard that and thought, well, I'm not the isolated male, but I know who, oh, I know some of those people are. And uh, some of those people are surrounded by living human beings. Yeah. yeah uh, I, some of them are married, right? And so it's not about how many people, you know, do you say, hey, Steve, you know, to every day. It, it, it's about this connection we're talking about. So, you, so, so if you're listening, make sure that you really take your inventory and, and figure out if you really are, you know, psychologically isolated, even though you're surrounded by people. You know, there is, there is um, some people who are depressed and when they get depressed, they will perceive that they have less connections with other people than they really do. Um, that was one interesting thing from reading and digging in the research is there's a difference between perceived isolation and actual isolation. And perceived isolation is actually more correlated with worse mental health outcomes. So even if you perceive it, then, okay, you know, you should make an assessment, you know, are you depressed? And if you are depressed, you should get treatment for it. Um, you know, psychotherapy, psychiatry, there's day treatment programs for depression. You don't have to be depressed the rest of your life. And number two, you know, build the relationships, give the attention and start that process. David, I have something I want you to do for me in the next 24 hours. Are you ready? I'm ready. I need you to go get some new business cards made, and they say, Diamond David Pewter. Psychiatry. No, it doesn't need to be Diamond David. Uh, Diamond, Diamond is something, by the way, that 
that you are making up. <laughs> I don't know why you would say diamond. No, you're, right. you're bright. Dr. Peter never said And hard is in hard and alluring. And highly so sought bad. out. Hey, um, what is it? Is it a sapphire? I, I, listen, I hope we make it. I want to, I want to say one more really quick, serious thing that, that, um, that, um, damn it. I'm struggling today, guys. Um, I hope that people listen to this show and listen to the last show we did with Peter and even other shows where Scott and I have talked about counseling and they, and they, and they, uh, and therapy and that they, we, we can take some of that and make, make it okay. Like it needs to be okay to go get therapy. It doesn't mean you're sick. It doesn't mean you're broken. By the way, like I think everybody's broken anyway, right? Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so, Calvinist. but, but, one of the things that's important to me that not, might be the only long lasting um, legacy that my dad w- is leaving my brother and my sister and myself was that he was the guy that made it okay to go get help. He needed help. My dad was mentally ill and we didn't have any of that in my family, at least that we knew of before him. And that generation, that generation really from 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 us, from like um, the older generation X through the baby boomers seem to not talk about their shit. And there is this stigma that comes with going and getting help. And um, it's been one of the most freeing things that I've done in my life in the past decade is, is making it so that my dad made it so that it was okay to go get help. And he made it okay. And then my brother went on a fishing trip with my brother, with my dad one day. My brother was really struggling with his growing business and the, and the issues. And my dad said, uh, son, it's okay to get help. And my brother went and got help. And then three years later, I needed help. And I called my brother because my brother was one of these friends that we talked about that have, we had all these things and it was safe. And I was like, Chris, I don't know what to do. And Chris said, you got to go get help. I've got a number. Let me get a number. And I went and got help. And it, it makes a difference. And so, um, get rid of the stigma, right? Like if you're that person that's depressed, if you're that person that is perceiving isolation, that you don't feel like anybody gives a shit about you and, and no one is empathetic towards you, like go, just go get help. It's okay. It is so freeing to do that. It, um, it, you know, we go to the dentist to get our teeth cleaned and we go to the barber and we get our hair cut and we get yeah. our oil changed. Go to the goddamn counselor. Yeah. Would you please? That yeah, made a huge, like, it's made a huge difference. And, in my life, and I know Scott, Scott and I have talked about this privately off the air many times. And so I'm, I'm thankful, thankful for people like you, Dr. Peter, that are, have given their life to, to help other people. And we need more people like you. Yeah, but not too many. I mean, we really need to get some things done. And he's over there empathizing. <laughs> <laughs> we have to build bridges. And, I mean, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Of course. Oh, man. It was, it was like, Matt, that was like a really beautiful I mean, you're tearing up, you're tearing up talking about it. You're passionate about it. Um, and for good reason, you know, there's a lot of people who will suffer alone and they will not get help even after unfortunately listening to that. And that's, it's too bad. Um, you know, exercise, therapy, sleep, eat healthy, though that can help the majority of people. That's right. It, it really can. Um, getting therapy, you know, and I would say find a therapist that you can connect with. Okay. Find someone that you feel heard by and give it 20 sessions and just show up weekly. Don't expect much. Just give it 20 sessions and see if you can work through whatever comes up into your mind in the sessions, report it to them and see what happens. Yeah. Nothing, nothing worse is going to happen. Yeah, go give right. a shot. There is another Barbell Logic podcast. We cry in almost every episode. I yeah. cried about it's me this time. Maybe this morning. It's true. That's true. Rip. Uh, Scott. Scott cried Call like crazy. Like, <laughs> Scott, cried, cried, Scott cried like crazy over True Grit. Went and saw True Grit with John Wayne. Oh man, like a baby this morning recording podcast. It's like, right. Oh man, so good. So, no, it's good. So there's good. another show. Thank you, Dr. Peter, for doing this. Go listen okay. to David's show. It's the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Psychotherapy Podcast. I always get it messed up, mixed up. You can also follow him on YouTube. If you want to see the video of this, it'll be on his YouTube channel. And you can follow him. You can go look him up on uh, 
Insta. He's easy to find and he shares good stuff and he interacts with his people a lot. Uh, anything else you want to say there, sir? We would love, we would love to make you a reg. We would love to make you a regular guest on this show. I think it's good, right? You come for the barbells and you stay for the lifestyle stuff sometimes. And so if, uh, if, if you'll, if you'll be a guest, we would love to have you. Great. I would love it. I'm, I'm trying, I would love it. I appreciate you guys. I'm trying to be a podcast pimp and have like a whole stable, a stable of you. Good. Stable. Yeah, no, I mean, it's oh. true. Like, it's just, oh, okay. you, you get these guests and you're just like, sometimes you're like, man, this is so good. And, and the reality is there are some people who either for whatever reason, they just will not go see a therapist after that, or maybe they literally cannot afford a, a decent therapist. And that this may be the, the, you know, the, it may take five episodes with Dr. Pewter before it finally sort of breaks through and like, okay, listen, this was really good. Dr. Peter wasn't actually talking to me. He was talking to Matt and Scott on a podcast. I want to be able to talk to somebody like that. And it, and it, it may take four, five, six, seven, ten 10 episodes with you to be able to actually break through to some people. I get it. And um, so I think you provide a tremendous amount of value to our, to our listeners um, outside of the realm of, of how to program your squat in intermediate and advanced training. There's, there are other things that are, that are more important. Shit's so boring anyway. <laughs> this stuff's so good. I like it because it's like free. It's like free psychotherapy for me for us. We get to sit here and we just we get pewter for for an hour, and I don't have to pay him. The, I don't have to write him the check. You're like you go downstairs, <laughs> and, and Rachel's like, "What's wrong?" You're like, "Oh, I got the pewter." <laughs> I just love you so much. I'll oh just, man, you guys are I'll kind. Just, I'll just dote on my wife all night. And yeah, I'll give her all this Should affection I, and attention. What? What's going on with you? <laughs> like, Wait, did you make a Rachel Reynolds Reynolds impression? Yeah, right. I don't know her. I don't know her. He's like, he married a Missouri girl. That must be the way she talks. That's right. Oh, man. But Missouri, as all the, as all the politicians. By the way, if you say Missouri to me, I promise you, if you say Missouri to me, we will never have a connection. We will not be friends. I will not empathize with a fucking thing you ever say. <laughs> ever use the word Missouri. <laughs> Because no one in this in this did you just do actually, a bump of coke? What was that you rubbed? No, on? what? It's my it's my snot no, on my it was David. Oh, no, no, David. no, I got some hummus here, guys. Oh, that oh. God! Either one would have been super California. Like if you <laughs> That's bump true. Coke, rub that That's on your. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, oh, thanks for doing man. the show, dude. I good, appreciate it. It's been times. great as always. Hey, clean living, David. Rubbing that hummus on your gums. There's another barbell logic hey. podcast. <laughs> What's that, David? <laughs> If you got any questions you want us to answer? Oh, I'm can. saying, I, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man. Okay, I was gonna say, if anyone's a Game of Thrones fan, I'm doing oh. some Game of Thrones analysis on my Instagram. Oh, um, where we watch clips and I teach people how to how to do some empathy and some psychological stuff that's going on in the clips. Yeah. So, that's yeah, that's kind of yeah. Don't let Scott thing. talk. That show's the best show of all time. It's amazing. That show is absolutely incredible. It has, it has now dethroned Breaking Bad for me as the best show ever. Oh, man. That's correct, pretty good. The correct it's, answer is The Sopranos. Send your questions to... By the way, it's an excellent show. Sopranos.com, and we'll answer those on a full, uh, future question and answer show. And hey, go to uh, Stitcher. Go to Stitcher this time. Why Stitcher? I hate Stitcher. Because other, some people don't, don't use what you mm. use. I, I'm not empathizing with your Stitcher statement. Uh, Apple is losing market share, and they're getting ready to lose a whole lot more. Yeah. And uh, we're going to Spotify have... is now in the uh, podcast market. Are we on Spotify? We are on Spotify. We are on yes. iHeartRadio. Yeah. We are on uh, TuneIn. We are on SoundCloud. We are Beautiful. on Stitcher. All those are awesome. Google Play. So go check us out on any of those things and forward a link to this show to some person that you know who is mentally unsound. Now, if your friend... <laughs> Or just anybody else who actually needs therapy, which is pretty much every human on the planet. So, so if your friend sent you a link to this show and you just heard this, he thinks you're fine. But go, but, but now forward this to one of your buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go. Slap him on the butt. Here we go. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs>